Yeah, so I've, uh, I too have a game to show off. Apparently that's something that people find fun when you're not actually working but still want to program. Um, so I've been building a clone of the game Risk, uh, which if you don't know is sort of a world map and you get armies that you can place and sort of defend and attack territories and the goal is to conquer the world. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is what the game looks like. There's actually two maps. Steve. What? What's up? The button. Oh, the button, <laughs> yes. Cool. Uh, so the game has two maps. I started with a map of Japan because it's smaller than the world, and I thought that would be easier. But eventually I was like, you know what? I kind of just want to play Risk, so there's an Earth map as well which you'll recognize. Uh, nothing is drawn to proportion. I kind of ripped this from, I think Wikipedia has an SVG of the Risk world map, which was nice. Uh, yeah, but to the thing Ryder was asking about, and I'll give kind of more of a high level overview later, uh, but when, so this all happens over Phoenix channels. Um, you know, if I click start game, right, that's sort of some kind of action that a player has initiated and that has to filter into the system and different parts of the system have to respond to it. Um, so if I click start game, it does a whole bunch of stuff. It uh, as randomly assigns all of the territories to the six players in the game. Um, it, you can see the numbers there correspond to how many armies are in that territory at the time. Uh, it all starts with one. I think that's about it. Uh, so. What actually happens when I click start game? Uh, we've, I've got some JavaScript, and the whole front end is built in React. Uh, I think it's the game.js, yeah. Cool, so that just fires an action in JavaScript called start game, um, which I've extracted into a this.action function which that's what's doing the, uh, sending that message over the Phoenix channel. Um, each game has its own channel uh, with just a random token identifier. You can see that in the URL here. Uh, so that's just a way that multiple people can play the game and not run into each other. Uh, let me make this a little bigger too, sorry. Um, so each action has a type, um, which I feel like I'm, I've considered that becoming kind of a, a struct or maybe its own module, um, but for now it's just uh, a map. Um, so it's got the type key, and that's how the system knows, well, was this a place an army action, or was this a start game action, or was this an end turn action? Um, so that gets pushed over the channel using the Phoenix JavaScript client. And then in the game channel, uh, we've got, this is just a gen server, um, following typical kind of Phoenix channel conventions. And we're handling, when it receives the action um, message, it's going to get an action, which is a map, uh, as well as the socket is just the user's connection to, um, you know, through the browser to Phoenix and to the application. Uh, and I turn all the keys into atoms, just because that's easier to deal with and pattern match on. Uh, but what I've tried to do is keep the channel as slim as possible because uh, channels are sort of hard to test. So uh, really just I, I'm delegating all of the action to the game server. Uh, so the which game this action just took place on, which player attempted to initiate this action, and then what the action itself was, uh, which is a map. Uh, I could probably pattern match on that for validation. So. Right, you do an action in the browser, the JavaScript sends that to the channel. Uh, the channel is just passing that along to the game server, which is like a little bit deeper in the system. Um, and the game server, here's where my code comes in. The channel is mostly just following uh, the Phoenix channel conventions. But the game server is just a regular gen server. And when, it, when we call uh, game server.action, that's gonna call the action function here, which sort of following the gen server uh, sort of client API conventions, uh, it's going to identify the, which particular game server process we need to send this message to. Uh, and I'm doing that with a via, via tuple. Um, 
Where'd that go? So that's just a function I've got. And I'm using Elixir 1.4's registry. And basically just any time you start a game, it creates a process and stores that process under some random token. And then any time a player makes an action, uh, we send that token and that's how we can tell which process, which game to route that action to. Um, so sort of hand wavy, the via tuple stuff's not super important. Uh, but we just send a tuple of the action and the player who took it and then the um, map with the type key of what that action was. And again, the map's just a data structure of like what just happened. Um, so that gets cast to the particular gen server itself and then the server uh, will handle the cast of the action. Uh, and here's where I've got some pattern matching. So if the action type is start game, um, we call game.startGame, uh, and otherwise we call game.handleAction. So there's kind of some misdirection here. Uh, I haven't really made up my mind about who's, res who's responsible for what, uh, but ultimately everything kind of gets pushed into this game module, which is where all the rules of the game live. Um, so within the game module, um, <clears throat> you'll see functions here. So handle action, this is where all the pattern matching goes. And this is probably closest to the sort of parser idea. It's not a parser uh, because there's only, what, one, two, four actions I need to handle at this point. But as the game gets more complicated and there are more actions, I may need something a little more complicated. Um, but, and this might get, tell me, Ben, if this is what you were talking about with the struct. Uh, it's not a real struct, but it's just a map with a type key to pattern match on like what kind of command this was and then some require additional arguments and so the um, the map can have additional keys if you need to know like which tile or which territory um, you know for an action like placing a unit we need to know where uh, for an action like attacking we need to know from where and to where and then for an action like moving we've got to know from where to where and then how many you're trying to move um, and so that I considered turning that into uh, because the game all the rules of the game, you know, it's almost a 300 line module, so there's a lot going on here. Um, one thing I considered, which I think is maybe what you were talking about, Ben, was extracting like an action struct. Is that big enough? <clears throat> and really then just the, instead of passing maps around, um, you know, this action struct could contain some of the action logic or possibly even uh, different structs or modules for each one. So you'd have a place unit uh, struct and then all the logic for like what happens when one action gets called could live within that module rather than everything being in this one big bucket of the game server. Um, so does that maybe illustrate yeah, that's what good. you were getting at? And then you'd have like a G you could have a DSL where you could do you did and, and pass it under they have lots of implements for behavior for like a protocol. Sure. Where, uh, you can then register all those modules at compile time or runtime uh, so that they all know how to work, work together. So this would have a behavior like, say, like, action. Yeah, like actionable or something. Or something that I, 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 you know, I have a command uh, behaviors. Everything has to respond to run with regard to Yeah. The, yeah there okay. You know. And I'm forgetting, well, this will be the implementation, which I think and some version of Elixir allows the at callback metadata if yeah, a function I, is just implementing an I interface. Think one, three, and I are all support that callback. There's at info, IPL. Oh, okay. So that it's implementing that behavior. I think. You have to say what like, well, Oh, okay. Uh, like that? Yeah, I think so. And the compiler will throw up and Cool. So that, yeah, that feels a little heavy on the organization, but I think only because I've got four actions right now, and right. as you get more, right, and you had a ton of actions in your game, like that seems like a pretty good pattern. Yeah. Um, Ryder, I'm curious before you go, what do you think? What, what I like about the approach that I'm pursuing is that it allows you to put uh, your, your command and your behavior together which this would too, but then it also enables you to see all those things really easily. You don't have to go digging around in this struct and that struct and the other struct. 
Um, so I'm, I'm just curious which is more important to me. <laughs> yeah, and that's something I struggled with. There's a certain easiness of having like literally all of the game's rules in a single file. And I think that's why I've resisted kind of breaking out separate modules and structs and all for the actions. Is it you know gives you more places you got to look, um, but that feels like just a perennial trade-off in programming, right? It's like yes, it's always true. easier to have one thing, but the bigger it gets, the less easy it becomes, and you got to make that other trade-off. So I trust yeah. your gut. And to me, this is this is an implementation of, of, of the command pattern. And it, it's a mapping, and it, it, it belongs. In that, um, and, and so with with this approach or those other approaches, I don't I don't get that. Um, so I'm curious, what what trouble would I run into with what I was trying to do? What what pain am I going to feel? Uh, so I guess one of the benefits of so you can do the this uh, the modular based approach, then you can have each one side a specific different variety. One of the reasons I want to do it this way is that each one can define like a custom parser so that you can add or add comps points. Like, like if I know specifically that like it's going to start with this word and I want like these next few bytes or whatever, yeah. or like just to um, bring X out better and like provide just the, the thing that you want. It's like the one that comes up specifically is the shop. So it's like you're saying like I want to buy this from that shop. Right. And so, like, just having that in, like a single break, I guess, might be a little. Like, you, you can give it names, name group names, and whatnot. So, I think that's good enough. So, you're saying it, it, it might be hard for the break, I guess, to be essentially complex enough. Yeah. Maybe robust enough is a better word to handle that. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the other thing, too, is if you ever want to get more complex with what you're doing, you might start running into having to ripple your code around to accommodate the fact that some stuff is not there, the more complex actions that might crop up. So you guys are you're having, I don't say spaghetti, but you're having a spaghetti effect because you're relying on the fact that your data is shaped a certain way, where if it's struck away to a struct, and all you can do is add another new behavior, yeah. you can just have all your old things stub a, a like, you can have it. You can have it where you like the ESL stub and implementation because it's like a no op. Yeah. And you can override it and stuff like that. Uh, it makes a lot less head headache for in the future. But yeah. and it's exactly what you said. It's if it's if you don't foresee that happening, mm. it's not worth it for sure. Like if you're pretty sure this is as far as you're gonna go, I I say this is totally fine. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I'll go farther. So. How many things are at How many actions are there? That's a great question. Uh, so right now there's four, and it's a fairly complete implementation of Risk, except there are no cards yet. So, so in Risk, yeah, every time you capture another country, uh, you get a card, and if you get three matching cards, you could trade them in for a bunch of bonus armies and then go like launch a huge attack, um, which adds, uh, I think, a little bit more interesting, a little more drama to the game, right? Things kind of, there's more big sweeping actions. Uh, my game right now is fairly predictable. Uh, usually the first player to get a small advantage, that advantage just compounds and then they win. Uh, if you'd like, you can see, we can just watch the AI play for a little bit. Um, but yeah, usually the first player to get uh, a continent Right in risk, that's what gives you a bonus. And so those bonus armies allow you to get more continents. And um, so anyway, with cards, you can, you receive cards, you could trade them in. Uh, maybe that's just one, one or two more actions. So I'm not sure how much more complicated it'll get. Uh, but yeah. Maybe a forfeit. Is there a forfeit? There's not a forfeit. Every game I've played of actual risk, someone has just given up. Uh, we don't have that. Oh, there's also, so this isn't part of the risk rules, but as in all human oh, activities. All yeah, blues. <laughs> I think blues, who? Oh, no. Orange has all of Europe now. Orange is going to go, yeah. Ukraine is strong. <laughs> so there's, in Risk, you can sort of form alliances and things like that. Uh, I shudder at the thought of getting the AI to implement that. I don't know how it would work, but uh, 
Right. Yeah, so there's, you know, you can have sort of actions like that, you know, temporary alliances. It might be enforced in the game or like, if you actually make an alliance with someone, you can't attack them. Um, so, I don't know, maybe double the number of actions. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. So, anyway, I'll talk a little bit about the AI uh, later, which is basically, it's extremely procedural. It's just like, in this situation, what would yeah. Steve do? Um, so the AI will just kind of use, it'll attack as much as it can and try to expand as much as it can, which leads to a lot of kind of sweeping moves where, right, so Ukraine's building up here and then moving into Saudi Arabia and going to take Asia and Australia. Ooh, oh. almost got all of Australia. Um, yeah, so the AI could be smarter and I, could, I can talk a little bit later about some ideas for that. Wow, so this is actually a pretty interesting game here. Um, <laughs> see, South America, oh, um, Okay, no, orange has Africa, but lost Europe, and green's out now. Oh, shit! Yeah. <laughs> Bites the dust. Uh, da, da, da. So, the, an interesting contrast, I think, to Eric's multi-user dungeon is that uh, this entire game is a single process. Uh, I considered implementing it where like each territory is a process or you know each AI player is a process but um, it didn't I didn't have to go that far uh, so it's just a single gen server uh, literally every detail about the game is stored in just the state of that gen server um, I wonder if there's a limit to the size of that state and if you know things will start slowing down the more stuff I stuff in there um, but at least risk itself, right? The game is just, uh, there's the state of all the board and the pieces and everything, and then moves are just valid transformations of that state. So it seemed like a perfect thing for Elixir, where you've got basically functions, and these functions just apply some change to a state and return the new state. Uh, oh, orange, orange, has orange has it, yeah. <laughs> So orange, I haven't figured out how to get orange to move that 30 to the front, because um, that's that's hard. A lot of so the the earth, and here goes orange's win. Um, I mean, earth is basically a network, right? Where each of these, all right, player six wins. Nice job, orange. Um, each each of these players, uh, no, sorry, each each country has some board, other bordering countries. I call them neighbors within the code. And so you've got this network of like nodes and these nodes have connections. Maybe graph is a better term. At least I think I've yeah, heard that term. Better. Nodes, okay. Yeah. So it's a network of nodes that have connections. Thanks, Ryder. Um, but trying to figure out, you know, if, if let's say player six has 30 territories in Nova Scotia or 30 units, and wants to get them all the way over to Southern Europe. Um, it's some really complicated, I think, network math to kind of figure out what the most efficient, uh, is there a path there? What's the most efficient path? Um, I don't think it's actually complicated. I think I just don't know the answer to that. So I'd, I'd love to learn some more about that. Um, cool. Yeah. That's the one I've come across too. Um, one problem, not problem, one uh, technical challenge for, for this game with the A star algorithm, and if anyone's not familiar, I'm gonna try and remember what that is. Uh, it basically looks at all of the possible moves and then figures out which ones get you closer to where you wanna go and then keeps repeating that until you get there. Um, Wikipedia has a great page with an animated GIF illustrating that. Um, but so the one challenge there is the extremely simplistic implementation of the AI in this game. Um, the way it works is when you start a new game, all of the players are controlled by the AI, unless you, uh, let me try that again. So if I don't give my name, you know, you get a game with just four AI players, but if I click join game, you know, I replace one of them, um, and then when it, and anyone else can too, uh, if 
anyone wants to play this next game, just go to this URL. Uh, I'll share it in the flow doc if you're in there, or just type it in. Dial 920. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, you know, I've got to make this vanity. I should. Yeah, there's really no reason. I guess you'd have to re-register the process. I don't know how that would work. Eh, I could add something that just maps the URL to a, a process. Um, so anyway, when it comes time for the AI to take a turn, I think that's in the game server. Uh, yep, so I've got my uh, hubristically titled AI.smart module. Um, all the AI gets is the state the current state of the game, and there's this take action function, uh, which just has a big conditional. If there are any unplaced units, place one following certain rules. Um, if you have to take a move, such as after you attack, uh, you get to move units into the territory you just conquered, then we do that. Um, if there's a neighbor, a neighboring uh, country that's owned by someone else, then we attack that country. Uh, if you can move units from somewhere where they're not doing you any good, uh, it'll just randomly move them somewhere else, whether that's, there's really nothing worse than useless units. So again, that could be way smarter, but for now it just kind of randomly moves your units, hoping that they'll be more helpful. Uh, otherwise, if none of these things are true, it ends your turn. So <clears throat> one thing, uh, so talking about the A-star algorithm, um, in, you, since you can only move once per turn, uh, for the AI to be strategic in moving, a, you know, making one move to get you closer to the front and then another move on your next turn, um, I would just need some way to store the state of that AI's like strategy. Uh, and the current implementation doesn't have any way to do that, but totally could. It'd probably mean just another gen server uh, for each AI for it to like plan. With this, you could move the last thing of your turn as much as you want. Spot to that connected area. Yeah. So I guess the A server would just be for that. Sorry. So like know that it's continuous. It would. I'm trying to think. Um, so say there's like, say the place you want to get those units to is three, three jumps away. I guess, okay, so I see what you're saying. The A star algorithm. Would, yeah, A star algorithm and basically just look at all of my possible moves and choose the one that gets me closer yeah. to there. And then the next turn, you wouldn't need any state because it would just, here's where you are, choose the next move that gets you closer. I misunderstood, and that seems like it would be a little even easier than I expected. Um, let me see, has anyone signed up? Yes, oh cool, Eric, Dave, and Bethany. So let's play, uh, or start to play a little bit of a game here just to illustrate how it works. Um, I'll start the game. Uh, so player one goes first. I always like to start in the corners, so I'm going to put all of my units in the bottom right corner. And so if you, you click on a territory, and that sort of highlights all of your possible moves. Um, since there's only one adjacent territory, I have no choice but to attack that one. Um, and since I attacked with two units, it automatically moves those in. But anyway, there's nothing else I can do here. Actually, if I wanted, I can move back. Uh, and I've got a move UI here where I can choose, but I'm not gonna do that because I wanna keep uh, this territory defended. So I will end my turn, and now it becomes Eric's turn, playing as green. And you can't actually see what Eric's doing on his screen, but it should be reflected on mine. Oh yeah, Eric had, uh, so for every three Every three territories you control, you get one bonus army to place, just like in Risk. Um, so Eric placed his, he's doing some attacks. He's done, I think it's Dave's turn, playing as yellow. We can see, and so one thing I wanna add is some sort of feedback, maybe something highlights or there's a log or something to be like, hey, what did Dave just do? Um, so I don't have to like look at 24 different numbers and guess which one just changed. Oh man, you should have. Uh, did it break? Oh, there we go. Maybe 
Oh, cool. Yeah, so you, you attacked another territory and conquered it. And you can keep going or you can I stop. So you click, yeah, click the place you want to start from and then click the adjacent territory that you want to get to. So you could actually have a ton more actions. Like when he targets yeah. country, you could have an action target broadcast that he's targeted. Oh, that's a good point. I probably should do that. Um, I'll get into the front end in a little bit. Uh, but it's React, and so there's some state that's stored on the server, which is like, you know, the core stuff. Uh, but anything UI related is just on the client right now. So that means, yeah, I can't see any sort of selections he's made until he actually commits to making a move. Yeah. But I like that idea. I would at least get to see more of, you know, my opponent's thinking process of like what they're clicking on, yeah. where they're going. You can also probably just, so everyone's sitting in the Phoenix channel, so you can probably just like just flat out just broadcast like exactly what he's doing. Yeah. Just like react to the data. Sure. Yeah. And. I'm just clicking all over, I have no idea. Well, I think, I think you're out of units to attack with. Okay. Sorry. They probably should tell you that. Noted. Uh, but you ended your turn, now it's Bethany's turn. Bethany is placing some units. So what determines, like, if you actually want to battle? Have die going on? Yeah, right? I do. I'll, I'll show that in a sec. That was one of the cooler Elixir implementations. Because um, it, it does basically do how a risk die roll works, where, if you're not familiar, um, the attacker has an advantage if you have more armies. You can roll up to three dice, and the defender can roll up to two. And you basically just match, you sort them. So if the attacker rolls a five, four, and a three, and the defender rolls a four and a four, um, you match up the five and the four, and then the four and the four, and the defender wins ties. Uh, cool, so Bethany took her turn. We won't play the whole game through, uh, but what I was saying there, about how battle works, and I've got a battle module for that. Um, I basically just followed how risk works. So the attacker, uh, however many units you're attacking with, you know, say you've got 20, you can still only roll three dice, so we take the minimum of three in that number, and then we just roll that many times. And then the compare rolls function is a bunch of pattern matching and recursion uh, but basically when, let's see, compare rolls. Boy, you know, as, as proud as I was of this code, I'm having a hard time figuring out what it's doing. <laughs> uh, but there's some, so your rolls are a list, and we, <clears throat> I think, sort them, and then pluck the head off the list, which is the first item, and Elixir is really great at grabbing heads off of lists, uh, and then compare the two heads, and then the tails are just the rest of the list. Um, and then these bottom two uh, function heads, or function bodies, uh, when, and I, I reverted to acronyms here because these method sig or function signatures were so long, but when the attacker head, which is basically, you know, the, the top attacker role is greater than the top defender role. Um, oh, that's right. So this function basically recurses and tallies up how many units are lost by each side. So when the attacker's role is greater than the defender's role, the defender losses gets incremented by one. Uh, otherwise, when the attacker role is less than or equal to the defender's role, because in risk defenders win ties, uh, then the attacker's losses gets incremented by one. And both, both sides' losses uh, is just a tuple that gets passed through this function, and it just recurses until it's out of rolls. Um, and here's just, yeah, we've got a random one to six integer for each die roll. Um, there's probably a more efficient way to do this, but it was sort of fun trying to implement. I knew, I knew the logic for the game of Risk, and so turning that into Elixir uh, was pretty cool. Um, so just to show a little bit of the front end, it's not really Elixir, but uh, if anyone's interested in doing something like this, it might be useful. Uh, <clears throat> the game board is just an SVG, which if you're not familiar, um, SVG is similar to HTML or XML. Um, it is a tag-based markup format. Um, so I can show 
I think it's in board dot or data dot js. Yeah. Um, so SVG is a markup language for images, vector images, and each uh, so a path is one of the elements of SVG that basically just describes a line. And every territory in on the board is just a line that kind of swoops and you know whatever the territory looks like. Um, and it's got a whole mess of complicated geometric data that you don't have to care about. Uh, but the important thing is that for Japan, for example, there's 24 of these paths. Um, I just edited the SVG in Sketch. It's a vector editor and um, pasted it into the JavaScript here, basically. Uh, but the important thing is that each one that it has an ID. Basically, we get the game state. Uh, is it in board? Yeah. So the gen server keeps track of what are all of the territories, who owns them, how many armies are in each one. You can see, for example, here. Um, Right, so it's uh, the module name or the struct name is tile. Uh, it's not super clear here, but when you create a new tile, um, it's a struct that has an owner, which is which player you know controls this territory, how many units are there, and what are its neighbors. Um, so you can see here, like tile one is neighbors with tile two, and tile two is neighbors with tiles one, three, four, and five, and that's sort of how that graph gets built up of which uh, which tiles or countries border which other ones. And that all just gets stuffed into the gen server state. Um, anytime anything changes about the state, that whole thing just gets pushed to the front end. And that updates the React state, which basically loops, let's see, forget region for a second here. Uh, actually, maybe we can't forget region. And region is just a shortcut, or another name for the continents, uh, which are the parts, the groups of territories that grant you a bonus if you control all of them. Um, so region, OK, so we basically uh, loop over all the regions, for example, Australia. And then whatever tiles or countries are in that, let's say tiles, because Australia is obviously one country. Um, Whatever tiles or, or territories are within that region, uh, we render those as a tile React component. Um, and I think that's what's reaching into, yeah, so board data. Um, when we render that component, the, the board data here, again, this was just the SVG paths or the shapes. Uh, we just pass that shape in, and that gets turned into the, uh, the board. Exactly how is sort of, I'm not really sure, through the magic of SVG. Uh, but the, the thing is, the, the flow of data is you've got these structs in a gen server uh, state that gets pushed over the WebSocket channel to the client. And then the React component renders that data. Um, and because it knows the shape of each territory, um, it can render that shape as uh, you know a territory, but also any data that's in the gen server store or in sorry, I'm confusing my React and my uh, gen server terminology. Any data about that territory, such as who owns it or how many units, it can also kind of add that to that shape when it renders it. Um, I hope that sort of made sense, but the upshot is this turned out to be easier than I expected. Like, if you can find an SVG out there, um, you can basically use it to render some kind of state in your uh, in your gen server. So, I know nothing about sort of visual graphics programming, um, but I was able to do this mainly just by finding an SVG on the internet and mapping each shape to. Uh, a particular key and value in my gen server state, um, which, yeah, was easier than I expected. So, yeah, that's Sengoku. Uh, it is up on Heroku. Feel free to play. Uh, it supports online play, as you saw, so you can send a link to your friend. Um, fair warning, uh, anytime I deploy, 
the all the games get wiped. Uh, I don't do that very often, but <clears throat> one particularly cool thing about this was this was the first web app I've ever built uh, that didn't have a database. So it, it is a Phoenix app, but there's no Ecto, there's no Postgres. Um, literally, you know, it's just a web form, and when I click new game, it just spins up a single gen server process in Elixir, and uh, you know, all of the players' interactions. It's just one gen server, super lightweight. Uh, I haven't tested how many games it can support because I don't think I have that many friends, but uh, probably a lot, even on a Heroku free dyno. Um, so yeah, that was pretty neat that you could build a game and not need a database. Um, so when the Heroku dynos restart daily, yeah. what does that do? With that too, yep, so great point. Um, because these gen servers are just in memory, uh, whenever Heroku brings the app down, uh, all the games go away, unfortunately. So, is there a way around that for hosting Elixir? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but there is a platform as a service called GigaLixir that's, I don't want to say new, it's been around a little while, but I, it hasn't quite gotten a lot of attention yet. But it's basically Heroku specifically for Elixir apps. And one of the biggest selling points is that they never restart your app. Um, since more, more so than Ruby apps, I think Elixir apps tend to be longer lived um, because they don't use as many resources. So checking out Gig Elixir is one option. Um, and I've also considered maybe persisting the state somehow. I mean, it is ultimately just a data structure. I, I could bring in a database. Um, or Redis or something, and like, I don't know, every five minutes just save the state of the game, um, and then when the app comes back up after Heroku restarts it, or I restart it or whatever, just kind of repopulate the gen server with that state. Um, I've just been kind of too lazy to do that, but it seems like another option. Ben, you have a thought? You could serialize the state straight to a file. Could serialize it to a file. This is the state of the server, like with the ID. Yeah. I think that would help. I know Heroku does not promise. Yeah. But it's a good thought. Write a service to write the state to a gist. There we go. I'd I'd love to have so many people playing this game that I have that problem, uh, but I'm going to put off solving it for a while. But it's a good point about the file. What's that? Could run it on my own server, one of those five dollar Linodes. Um, yeah, I haven't haven't done that yet because I've been more interested in building this than figuring out how to host it. I I don't have any servers in my house. I probably should. I'm not a real nerd, right? But uh, no. For now, it's just yeah, up on Heroku. All the codes on GitHub um, under Steve Grassi, Sengoku. Um, yeah, well, to be honest, I ripped off some of that. When I was first starting to build this, I, I looked very closely at how Cocoa works. Um, and yeah, a lot of the communication and players logging in and choosing names, um, I followed that. So thank you, Lucas, for your, your excellent example. Um, and then similar to Eric, I do have a long list of things I want to add to this. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to them, but if anyone's interested, uh, PR is welcome. Um, you know, some of these are gameplay. Some of these are just fun things like sound effects, which I, I don't know how to do, but everybody loves sound effects, right? That's how your coworkers know you're playing games at work. <laughs> oh. You could probably store your board in a matrix, so like like a row is like you know you have your one or whatever. Mm. I think you're right. How would you handle, I guess you could handle diagonal. Hmm. Yeah. You use, yeah, you use vector maps to do your angles. But, but it's weird because they're, they're not in a shape. Yeah. So it's just touching neighbors. Yeah, it's just touching neighbors. That's right, a jump is still a jump. A jump is still a jump. Some. Is this uh, gonna be in here? Or this is in board. Uh, 
EX. I'm trying to see, right, so if you're in a, you know, two-dimensional matrix, everything can have at most one, two, three, eight neighbors, but I guess none of these have more than eight, so this probably could be represented in a matrix. Um, we'll see if, uh, if I end up having a problem that that seems like a solution to. I don't know. I think for now it kind of works. But I, yeah, I like the idea. Especially, it sounds like the, the math of calculating distances, which I know nothing about, um, is, could, could very well be that problem that the matrix is a solution for. So, yeah, I would, I'll, I'll make a feature for you. Oh. I would have the AI, I would, I would wait in certain zones with higher priority. Yeah. And have the AI, like, Basically, to bend borders, like keep some in borders. So, they, so if, once they lock a, a region in, mm -hmm. they like keep it defended so they don't lose it. Like, because that AI is kind of trading over and over again, they want to lock their borders in. Yep. Now, that's a great point. Uh, one, so, one thing that I'm interested in as far as the AI goes, and you know, kind of like I showed before, this is pretty procedural. It basically just kind of figures out what the current situation is and, and responds to that. Um, similar to the A star algorithm, um, I'm interested in yeah some way of like representing the entire state of the game with a score maybe or like some sort of weights, right? So if you if you own an entire continent, like your score is higher than it would be, or if your borders are well defended, your score is higher. And then sort of having the AI take more of a brute force approach because there's not there's only you know maybe a few dozen moves you can take in a given turn. Just looping over all those moves and have the AI choosing the one that results in the highest score, uh, and then consistently making that choice to maximize your your score, uh, and then maybe winning uh, as a result. You have to put postgres on this project. What you could do? Whoa! <laughs> is add some machine learning. Record players' movements. Yes. Start waiting their their plays. And so that's my long term goal. Start sorting like the winners, replaying. Their yeah, plays. who wins and what what sorts of moves did they take? An interesting thing about the um, that approach too is that you could have different kind of personalities for AIs. Like yeah. some would weight a great defense higher than you know owning a bunch of territories and maybe more defensive, and the ones that weight the number of territories that you control higher, you know, would maybe be more aggressive. Um, and that's another thing too. You could then feed into some kind of machine learning to figure out, you know, against humans, right? What are the best relative uh, weights of aggressiveness and defensiveness and whatever, and ultimately teach robots to destroy us, uh, which is sort of the, the end game of of this project. There you go. So thank you. Any other questions? I have no idea what TensorFlow is, and it scares me. It's a, uh, I think it's just, it's Google's uh, machine learning. It's like, it might run on their custom hardware uh, to make it super fast. So. Uh, probably not. But I will say, since we're talking about AI, uh, I will plug, uh, what's this? There's a fellow with a blog called Building the Future, I think? Automating the future. Um, yeah, so this blog does a lot of posts on machine learning, particularly in Elixir. Uh, and I understand that. So one day, maybe one day I'll learn TensorFlow, but the first approach I would probably take. Uh, is there any? I'm looking for like any kind of Elixir code. OK. Oh, no, that's just some setup. Um, anyway, this person has a library that helps you do kind of machine learning and neural networks in Elixir. Um, AutomatingTheFuture.com, I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, one day, I'll learn how to do that maybe and plug it into the game. Um, That'd be awesome. It'd be pretty cool. Yeah, that's how I justify this to my wife when she's like, why are you programming all weekend instead of you know, cleaning the house? I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna, or at least learn how robots will kill humanity so I can warn people. Like, yeah. Yeah, this is pretty wild stuff, but uh, 
seems interesting. Cool. Well, if there's no other questions, we're pretty close to closing time. Um, so we can just have some discussion, finish off the pizza, and, uh, and hang out. Thank you all for being here.